Ms. Indrani Sen Gupta to present bouquet to Professor Amita Singh to show our deep sense of gratitude. I would request Mr. A.P. Dubey sir to present bouquet to Professor B.P. Singh to show our deep sense of gratitude towards him. Sir, please. Thank you, sir. In this plenary session, our eminent speakers will deliberate upon highly interesting and relevant subjects such as issues and challenges of highly dynamic and highly complex power equations in the digital era, failure of sustainable development as a result of injustice or unfairness, discrimination based on species, especially discrimination against animals, and the critical issue of environmental injustice. We will start the session with the keynote speech by Professor Subhash Durlabji, who will speak on the topic, Engines of Power, Managing in the Age of Connections. Professor Subhash Durlabji is a retired professor of management at Northwestern State University of Louisiana, USA, where he has been since 1987. Prior appointments include Institution of Higher Education in India and Michigan. He earned his PhD from Michigan State University and an MBA from Cornell University. He has been teaching management subjects for more than 20 years. He has been a visiting professor in Japan, India and Mauritius, the last as the Fulbright Scholar. His publications include a book on Japanese business and numerous articles in the journal like International Journal of Value-Based Management, Human Relations and Decision Sciences Journal of Innovative Education. His most recent publication is Power in Focus, Perspectives from Multiple Disciplines. His current research interests include spirituality in organizations, e-business education, e-business management and cultural influence on organization behavior and management. Sir, now I have the pleasure of inviting Professor Durlabji for his deliberation on the topic Engines of Power Managing in the Age of Connection. Sir, please. Good late afternoon. And I know you are all uh, somewhat Sorry, tired out, uh, so I'm uh, uh, determined to entertain you a little bit here. Uh, <laughs> The uh, word crisis suggests that uh, there is a crisis uh, that requires an immediate uh, response of some kind uh, uh, um, uh, and that the scholars and dignitaries here will be able to come up with a spiritual paradigm to surmount this global management crisis. When I saw the theme of the uh, conference, uh, I, was, I was a bit taken aback because I don't recognize the uh, events uh, since uh, the last three years as really a crisis, uh, but rather uh, indication of something very, very big going on. And uh, uh, the Swamiji uh, before me uh, suggested uh, uh, quite uh, uh, in passing that by 2013 something major is going to happen. My, uh, my feeling is somewhat similar. And so I uh, want to uh, suggest that this gloom and doom feeling that we have uh, for not only the economic crisis, uh, financial crisis that's perpetuated uh, basically by the collapse of uh, capitalism as I like to see it, uh, but also all the Middle East turmoil, all the, uh, all the protest movements including our own uh, and the uh, worldwide Occupy movements and so on and so forth is really not a crisis, uh, but perhaps uh, uh, the evidence for uh, the next stage of uh, human and, uh, evolution and consciousness. And the important questions uh, then are why have all these things erupted all together in the short span of few months in 2011, especially the uh, uprisings in the Middle East and uh, of course our uh, own uh, uh, Indian uh, uh, political uh, movements as well. And then furthermore, what is it that has enabled the brave and steadfast response from the ISIS? I mean, if you look at what has happened in Egypt and Libya uh, and other countries like that, including USA, uh, there has been a lot of crackdown, a lot of police, a lot of violence. Nonetheless, these people keep coming back, keep coming back. They are not going away. So that was the question that I wanted to answer. And whenever something like that, uh, I notice that uh, when profound change descends, Seemingly suddenly, 
uh, uniformly across, uh, across all of humanity. The dynamic must be sought not in the particulars of each crisis or each you know, uh, 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 economic crisis or financial crisis or political crisis, but as an event, as a, uh, but in a more sweeping trajectory uh, that operates over generations. And uh, I'm going to take the liberty of going all the way back here uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, the eternal uh, quest of humanity. Uh, we have as our motto, as part of our uh, national motto, uh, this uh, from the Upanishad, lead me from the unreal to the real, lead me from darkness to light, lead me from death to immortality. And that's the eternal process of human consciousness uh, that we have started on uh, uh, with, the, with the dawn of consciousness and especially with the uh, insights, uh, profound insights of our uh, yogis and sages, sages from many, many thousands of years ago. Viewed through the lens of that kind of uh, progression uh, that have attended man's long and ongoing journey from darkness to light. All the turmoil and upheavals of the past few years turn out not to be a cry for a spiritual paradigm to save the day, uh, but rather the labor pains of a spiritual awakening that is already in place, brought about by a fundamental and permanent change in the nature and distribution of power. Uh, and uh, that's the point I want to make, uh, that it's the connectivity uh, that uh, has uh, emerged in the sciences Connectivity in the social arena that you are all aware of, all of you are carrying smartphones. Many of those smartphones are smarter than the people that are carrying them. Uh, and uh, the increasingly, uh, uh, increasing evidence that people are looking more and more towards, uh, towards uh, their inner selves. Uh, they are not satisfied. Uh, materialism is not providing the kind of happiness uh, that it uh, promised to and so on and so forth. And so those are the three streams that I'll be looking at. Uh, material connectedness, uh, integration and synthesis in the sciences. Social connectedness, and that's the uh, paradigm shift in management from hierarchical management to networks. And uh, spiritual connectedness that I believe has uh, emerged from the efforts of people uh, like Swami Vivekananda and all of those luminaries before us who have uh, gone uh, into the, to the West and now I think it has uh, had its uh, maturity, it's coming to a fruition. Uh, what we find in the sciences uh, is that there is a tidal wave of synthesis and integration going on. A tremendous excitement in the sciences. You keep up with the literature of Science Digest, Scientific American, you see every issue contains very, very exciting uh, very excited scientists talking about things that, that uh, seem, seem quite not in the scientific sphere. Uh, and what has emerged is uh, that uh, the divide and conquer strategy of science has been replaced by synthesis and integration. And similarly, the divide and conquer strategy in the social arena, uh, the politicians use that, uh, businessmen use that. Uh, uh, all of that, I believe, is going to be uh, left behind by this new spiritual awakening. Uh, all of it comes under the umbrella of evolution, reality viewed as it is, a trajectory of the whole, rather than a collection of isolatable objects and phenomena so that a strategic view of life and universe is emerging. Here's a, a quote from Subhash Kak uh, uh, in, from 2006 that impressed me. Uh, Indian cosmology is not in conflict with science, although it does speak of the domain of spirit that lies beyond language and rational science. It makes claims regarding the nature of consciousness and transcendent states of awareness that are so extraordinary that if they should be validated by science, they would change the way we conceive of reality. Well, it was these extraordinary claims that impressed me as a young boy uh, when I was exposed to uh, Indian spiritual uh, writings uh, in the Upanishads and so on and so forth, uh, that have held my attention uh, because these claims are so extraordinary that I was determined to find out what that was all about. And as it turns out, I think science is finally coming to validate exactly those 
claims. And so I'm going to give you a couple of examples of the extraordinary claims for Indian spirituality and then uh, show you a couple of uh, uh, recent uh, uh, statements coming from science. Uh, this is, of course, uh, from the Isha Upanishad, the first verse, and translates as Om, that is all, this is all. This all has been projected from that all. When all, this all emerges from that all, what remains is all. When this all merges into that all, the result is all. Now, imagine a 15-year-old boy reading this for the first time and saying, what can this possibly mean? <laughs> uh, and, of course, it's been a lifelong quest to try to discover that. So this is one of those extraordinary claims that uh, Subhash Kak was talking about, that if this is validated by science, then it would change the way we re view reality. And that, I think, is precisely what's happening. Uh, here's another extraordinary claim. Everything is sound. Sound is Brahman, the manifestation of the universe. It is sound that has become all life forms. Uh, it is sound that binds. It is sound that liberates. Sound is the basis of bondage. Sound is the basis of liberation. Sound is the bestower. Sound is the power. Sound is Brahma, the manifestation of the universe. Everything is sound. Sound and Rodin present. So here's another kind of statement that is coming from Indian spirituality that on the face of it uh, doesn't, doesn't impress, doesn't make sense, cannot be fit into any rational uh, system of thought. Here's, however, what the scientists are beginning to say now. This is all from 2012, from this year, recent uh, statements. There is this uh, theory of the origin, evolution, and nature of life, an article written by Mr. Andrew Lewis in a magazine, a scientific magazine called Life. This transdisciplinary theory demonstrates, demonstrates, mind you, he's making a claim that it demonstrates this, that purportedly inanimate, non-living objects, for example, planets, water, proteins, DNA, are actually animate. They are alive. Think about that for a moment. That could be a statement coming from Indian spirituality, similar to the ones that I just showed you. Uh, and uh, the theory then goes on to describe what it means, and it's basically saying that all objects in nature are nested vortices or walls of energy, matter, and information, self-regulating, self-correcting, feeding on the environment, growing and shrinking, interacting with other roles, worlds, and then eventually running out of steam or collapsing on themselves, just like life. And, of course, we know about uh, black holes by now, which is what? A sun collapsing on itself. Uh, we uh, conceive of our sun as it being eternal, but we do know that in about 800 billion years, not to worry, you won't be there, uh, the sun is going to collapse on itself as well. Uh, so so that's, that's the point he's making, that it's all, all the same. Uh, uh, oops. Here's uh, the scientist's uh, vision of the history of the universe. Before the Big Bang, there was nothing. And that's Big Bang right here. Uh, anyway, at the, at the left side. Uh, and we are somewhere here in between. This is the present moment. Can you... Oh, I see, I see. Where's the pointer? This is the point. Okay. And, oh, okay. So this is the Big Bang, and of course nobody really knows what happened at the Big Bang. Uh, that is completely a mystery to science. But then what is before the Big Bang, nobody knows. So we have assumed that it was nothing. <laughs> and we are here 13.7 billion years ago. That's the planets, and that's where we are uh, in the current moment. And they're projecting now that slowly... Yeah, you got rid of my pointer also. Oh, I see. So they see the pointer out there. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, so this is where we are, the, uh, the planets uh, here. And now they're projecting that eventually the entire universe will slowly dissipate into nothing. 
And again, that sounds like very much like what Indian spirituality. It's all a matter of perspective. Uh, if you look at my body, you see a frame very similar to the frames that you are uh, used to seeing. But that's a function of the light waves that are entering your eyes. Uh, if you were to be able to get an electron microscope for your eyes, that's what you would see, wouldn't you? Because I am a collection of trillions and trillions and trillions of uh, electrons, protons and neutrons. And in fact, if you go uh, further in, uh, into electrons, protons and neutrons, there are other smaller particles, that then if you go further in, and the scientists have done that, they find that these particles, very, very tiny wave-like particles, uh, pop in and out of nothing. <laughs> Energy is the basic constituent of the universe, even more fundamental than matter. So, it's all energy is what I'm trying to say, including consciousness. Our bodies, minds are powered by electricity, driving vast currents through exquisitely tiny molecular machines, motors, gates, switches, and chemical factories. So, it changes your view of who, what we are, what, what this is. Uh, the electricity is produced by trillions of bugs, they're called mitochondria that invaded our cells billions of years ago and are still there. And then uh, here's the electromagnetic spectrum, which is the entire range of energy uh, that uh, flows out of, uh, out of the sun uh, and uh, beyond. Uh, that visible light is uh, that colored light. That's all we are able to see with our limited eyes. Our minds and frames are very, very limited in terms of its capabilities and powers. What I'm trying to suggest is if you could have spectacles that could view in me in shorter wavelengths or longer wavelengths, you would see me as a collection of uh, energy waves or, uh, or as a speck in the, in the distance. So there are 100 trillion cells in my body, each a universe in itself, More, uh, nested within organs, nested within systems, each of these things, the organs are a, a unity in itself. The digestive system is a unity in itself, containing of all of these other universes in there. So it's all collection of your universes. So it again changes your, your perspective on what, what we see with our eyes. And I, I won't bother with this. Uh, here's another uh, interesting way to look at it. On the right you of course have uh, uh, your uh, uh, Sri Yantra on the left is a view along the axis of the DNA molecule. Okay, I say I've made the point that I think science is coming to the same conclusion as spirituality, and so I will uh, uh, I will skip the next two. This is the internet, not a picture of the skies. This is the picture of the internet, worldwide internet map produced by AT&T. And I just thought it was interesting to look at this and look at this, which is a picture of a nebula. <laughs> and again, I find, I find the, the similarity are somewhat astounding there. And again, then now I'm coming to the social connectivity. The internet changes everything. The fruits of scientific knowledge have been uh, mostly garnered by the rich and powerful, uh, by military industries, corporations. Now that knowledge is available to all of us through the internet and it is accessible and in fact that is what is allowing people like Bill Gates and other uh, you know, entrepreneurs to challenge these mighty industries and allowing consumers to challenge the corporations. Uh, climate change is an example of the uh, global consciousness of a worldwide problem and that is for the first time that it is a global uh, awareness of a problem. And this uh, shift away from special interest to people is fundamental and irreversible. So that's the point I'm making. Uh, the social power, of course, because of uh, the ability of people to uh, organize themselves has also been democratized. Uh, and then final point I want to make is that uh, uh, 50, 70 years ago, the West was more or less ignorant about yoga. Today you enter yoga, the word yoga in Google, search and you get close to 400 million results and these are real. These are people that are really, really searching now. Millions and millions and millions more people. In fact, mil uh, millions of them are here in India uh, who are coming from the West. So this has become now a global wave. Uh, the inner journey is no longer the preserve of a few strange people like me, but a huge new hunger in the soul of humanity. 
Uh, and regardless of what path one takes uh, in the inner journey, this quest to connect with our inner selves can only end in the realization. If I am of the nature of divine consciousness, so is everyone else and everything else. And that sentiment that we are all in it together and interconnected materially and spiritually in a great cycle of energy and power is the core of the new global consciousness and marks a turning point away from consciousness dominated by consumerism and narcissism. So I agree with uh, some of the Swamis who are suggesting that we cannot force radical change, that this change is here, it is happening, and what we are experiencing today uh, is the evidence, manifestation of that. The Sangam of these three great rivers of material connectedness in science, social connectedness, and spiritual connectedness, people searching within, uh, of human consciousness is the ground from which the new global spiritual awakening is arising. All three lead to, the, lead to the same insight about interconnectedness of the whole enterprise of life, viewed not in freeze frame but as a process, a trajectory of the whole uh, organism composed of the individual but intertwined trajectories of each member of the tribe. The new world order built uh, on the paradigm of connect and overcome will continue to swallow up the divide and conquer world because of the empowerment. And I'll, I'll just have to... Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I do want to say one more thing, and that's about the human energy and how it is wasted here. The colossal waste of human energy we, we live with daily in modern life in crowded cities lacking even basic civic facilities and crumbling overcrowded infrastructure, I'm talking, yes, about Varanasi, but lots of other places, and under corrupt regimes and shady businessmen and self-serving ego-led managers is criminal at best, but in my mind, no less than genocide, I think it's a national shame, uh, that uh, 65 years after independence, we still have people wasting 50, 40, 50 percent of their daily energy on simply living day to day, getting from work, getting uh, paperwork done, and so on and so forth. So that is my message that uh, uh, we need to, 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 to change this and uh, uh, respect the human energy because it is, uh, it is much, much more valuable than the hydrocarbon energy. The carbohydrate energy is much more valuable than the hydrocarbon energy, and we need to pay attention to uh, using it sustainably. So I'll uh, end this because uh, we are short of time.